On the show today, Liberty football stays perfect in the most dramatic of ways. We'll talk to head coach Turner Gill about the victory. Plus, a sit down with defensive coordinator Robert Wimberly and the story of a special friendship on the Liberty women's soccer team. It all starts now. You're watching Game On. What is up? Welcome to Game On. So glad you were able to join us this week. As always, alongside Rhett McKibben, I'm Matt Warner, and there's a chance we could be joined by Bobby Bolick a little later in the show. Always fun when Bobby stops by. Well, there's nothing wrong with a little suspense, and the Flames football team had us all on the edge of our seats during their last second win against Indiana State, and that's where we begin today's show. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that the 16,000 fans in attendance probably all departed with very little left of their fingernails because it was a nail biter, Rhett. For you sure. Got that? Okay, I'll make a picture gotcha. on the same page there. Let's take a look at how it all went down, shall we? Liberty and Indiana State. The Flames trying to move to 3 0 for the first time since way back in 2008. Now, the LU offense, which had been an unstoppable force in the first two games, was good once again. Buckshot Calvert to Antonio Gandy Golden for the score. Gandy Golden with 171 receiving yards. Second time he's gone over a buck 70 already this season. But amazingly, AGG would be one upped by some guy named Robert Pugh. For a team that hadn't passed well coming in, did the Sycamores ever sling it on this night? Pugh finished with 260 yards and two scores. This one would be tight coming down the stretch. Jump to the fourth quarter, under two minutes to go. Liberty up by one. Probert trying to extend the lead. Doink, oh. the iron unkind for Alex Probert. The Sycamores would get the ball back with a chance to win it. That guy couldn't believe it. Just over a minute to go now at midfield. No timeouts, and they ran the ball on third and five. Questionable, only gained two yards. Clock continues to run. They scramble to the line, and on fourth and three, pass incomplete. Game over, right? Yeah, wrong. Moments later, the officials announced that Liberty had called a timeout before the fourth down play. We'd have to do it all over again, but not before they added 24 seconds to the clock. They messed up that whole situation. We'll get to that another time. Instead, they get fourth down to do all over again. They convert, they take advantage, they drive down the field all the way to the six yard line, and that would set up a 23 yard field goal to win the game. A chip shot. A chip shot that would be denied by the right hand of Corbin Jackson. A walk-off block, a Liberty specialty by the way, seals the win for the Flames. They take it 42-41. Corbin Jackson may have been the hero on this night, but he was quick to share the credit. It's something we practice uh, every time uh, in practice, every day pretty much, field goal block. They made, they made the call and uh, to God be the glory, I was, I was able to get up there and block it with my hand. Uh, the D-line got a great push. It was definitely a team thing. It's a memory you'll never forget. That's something I'll always be able to go back and tell my kids and the same way everybody else in there. Well, with that Flames win, let's take a look at where they stand in the latest FCS national media poll. The Flames keep on creeping up the list and now sit at number 16. Prior to the season, the last time the Flames were nationally ranked was October 12th of 2015. Filling out the top five in the nation are James Madison, North Dakota State, Sam Houston State, South Dakota State, and Jacksonville State. To touch more on the Flames in detail is Matt and head coach Turner Gill. Yeah, always thrilled to be joined by Coach Gill. Uh, Coach, thanks for coming by as always. And do you just love drama, or how does that work? Because you keep us on the edge of our seat, or at least the team did this past week. Walk me through that final minute plus of what else was going on. We thought the game was over. Players thought the game was over. Walk me through the timeout, when it was decided to be taken, and then kind of the explanation of what happened from then. Well, really, I guess when the uh, timeout occurred there, we had uh – Again, our defensive coaches mentioned to say that we need a timeout. Coach, we need a timeout. Our secondary didn't get the signal. Okay. They didn't get the call. So, call timeout. Yeah. So, it was definitely a timeout was called before the snap, uh, as far as that goes. Now, all the other stuff that yeah. went on, yeah. from my understanding here, as far as the Big South Conference, they had mentioned that they made a timing error. Sure. was by the replay official, and that's kind of was it. And uh, we won the ball game, so thank the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, you'd hate to have to sort all that out if it had gone another way with an error like that, I'm sure. You guys block a kick there to win it. Third time in the last four years you guys have been in that scenario and blocked a kick. How much do you focus on that, whether it's in, in camp or in practice during the week? And, and is it a technique thing? Is it just a good athlete thing? How does it work out? How has it worked out so often in your favor? Well, there's a lot of people involved. It's yeah. not obviously the one person that maybe gets the block. He gets all the credit, he, and it is well-deserved. But there's probably four or five other people that have to get a big push yeah. as we kind of tell them to change the line of scrimmage. 
knock them back at least two yards. We want the jumper. Uh, we think we had David King and really Corbin Jackson with yeah. the two jumpers in this case. They want to be jumping at the line of scrimmage. Uh, if they're jumping back one yard behind the line of scrimmage yeah. or two yards, they're not going to be able to get the kick uh, because we're anticipating a low kick. And so, therefore, the guys knocking them back, I think it was a great story there, yeah. Juan Wells and Tolan Avery were the big three guys that are knocking uh, the guys back. And then the guys made a great timing on the jump. You never know what the timing of the yeah. jump. The other thing is you have to get lined up correctly. So where the ball is going to be kicked over the uprights, you have to be kind of in the mm. middle area. So you got to be in the guard area or in the tackle gap area. It depends on how far is it off the hash. So that's another adjustment by the jumpers have to make. Antonio Gandy Golden, another monster night, over 170 yards receiving for the second time this season. You have a lot of weapons. Even with that, do you go into a game thinking, boy, we really like this matchup with a specific receiver? Or maybe do you look more at we, if we can attack this defensive back, how do you determine or do you with so many weapons is it just pick your poison within the floor of the game? Yes, to be honest, it's all of the above. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and say that we don't look at matchups. We do. Uh, critical situation, we may say, hey, if we got an even deal here, let's go this way. Yeah. Uh, if we have a balanced situation, then you just read through your progression and make the best read, make the best throw. We feel good about all of our receivers. Again, we got about four or five, six guys really yeah. that we actually rotate and we trust all of them. Well, it's all been working on the offensive side. And on the defensive side, mm -hmm. some things I know you want to shore up. Defensively, a little some miscommunication it looked like in the defensive backfield. I know there's the one busted play, but looking at that as a whole, some of the big plays that you allowed, are those easy fixes? Are those things do you feel like you can clean up rather quickly? Well, I, I think we can clean them up. I think we actually uh, decide to sell for the run a little yeah. bit more. We want to make sure we stop the number six, which was a very good uh, running yeah. back, uh, Booker. So we accomplished that. And uh, then we didn't know if they how much they would go into really throwing the football. They decided to go that route a little bit more than what we thought they would. But we forced that issue, and they executed to the best of their ability. So I'm not concerned. Our guys still made plays when they had to make them. They were a good football team. As far as I knew, they were getting better and better each and every yeah. week. Uh, they do have some talent uh, as far as Indiana State. Uh, so I think our guys are getting valuable reps. Uh, I think we're getting better and better each and every week. So our defense will be ready to go. Coach, can't start any better than 3-0. and Congrats on the win so far. Good luck the rest of the way. We Thank appreciate you. it. To God be the glory. Absolutely. Rhett? Back over to you. Thank you, Matt. Well, in college football programs, there are so many people that are involved in making a team successful. In this edition of Go Talks, we introduce you to defensive coordinator Robert Wimberly, the 2014 FCS assistant coach of the year, has been working with Coach Gill for over a decade. Coach, thanks so much for stopping by. We appreciate it. Football, when did that first become a part of your life? Do you remember when you were first kind of fell in love with the game or, or remember kind of it being a part of your life? I think I've always loved football. I can remember even as a young man, I, I'm, I was born and raised in Miami, Florida. I was always a Dolphins fan, Hurricane yeah. fan. And as a child, I remember the Super Bowl where the Dolphins uh, played San Francisco 49ers and lost in the Super yeah. Bowl, and then I cried. <laughs> uh, I remember when the Dolphins beat the Chicago Bears to end their – Un undefeated season yeah. and then I remember when University of Miami played uh, Notre Dame and Jimmy Johnson decided to go for two he didn't get it I cried got in <laughs> trouble parents I didn't want to eat dinner that Saturday evening yeah. my dad and mom sent me to the room uh, and I really always loved athletics yeah. I always loved the competitive side of it and that's always stayed with me a lot of tears for Dolphins fans probably throughout the years so you're <laughs> not alone there you go into coaching and coaches spend their whole careers looking for a star, right? You know, some go their whole careers and never find one. You find Khalil Mack, now one of the great defensive players in the NFL, defensive player of the year for the Raiders. Tell me how you found I've read some stories. Yeah. Diamond in the rough. How did you find this kid? Well, just, you know, beating the bushes. You know, um, GM for at University of Wisconsin, that's what Coach Irish used to always talk about. Find, beat the bushes, yeah. beat the bushes. And I had the east coast of uh, Florida at the time. And I went by a school, uh, Fort Pierce, Westwood High School. And uh, the head coach at the time was just raving about this young man, but he was just coming off an injury. And uh, I just stayed in contact with him over the summer. I got his first three games of senior year. Fell in love with him. He was able to bend, sink. Uh, he was relentless to the ball, but he didn't have a lot of film. And, you yeah. know, in recruiting, yeah. it starts to move earlier and earlier. And uh, when we was here at Liberty, I was here, uh, he committed to us here at Liberty. I was blessed and the opportunity to go further my career 
at the University of Buffalo, and then uh, he made that decision to join University of Buffalo. Yeah, a lot of people may not even realize that he had initially committed to come here to Liberty yes, sir. and then ended up going to Buffalo, and obviously what a great career he went on to. But you talk about you moving on. You were here at Liberty first. What was it, from like 04 to 08 yeah, or something like that? Yeah, yes, sir. And then you left to go Buffalo, joined Turner Gill. You went to Kansas. Yeah. Did you ever think, you know what, maybe we'll, maybe we'll bend up back. It's wild how you ended up back yeah. here. What went through your mind when you knew that this could be an option coming back for a second time? It had to be a God thing. Yeah. That's, the, that's the first thing that went through uh, my wife and my um, thoughts was, you know, this is nobody but God uh, to connect us back here to Liberty. Uh, and so, you know, it was definitely surreal. You come back, you leave here. I start off in the Hancock building. Yeah. You know, to see the trans, for, I mean, just the fr- transformation of this university. I tell people, you know, it's not too many people you, opportunity you run into and you meet them and you can say they were part of a legacy. Yeah. And to be a part of Liberty University, uh, you know, you, you never know how long your career is going to be here. But, you know, I can literally say I was a part of a legacy of a person's vision that said we would take this mountain. What do you feel like is maybe the biggest thing or, or a couple of things you've learned from your career in coaching? What are some like life lessons you feel like you've gained personally? Uh, you look at uh, 1 Corinthians 3, uh, when uh, Paul talks about it, he says, hey, I planted the seed, Apollos watered the seed, but God gives the increase. And, uh, you know, for me, I don't like to get emotional about it, but that's what I am. I know I'm a seed planter. Uh, I know that uh, God has called me to uh, minister to young men uh, try to set the example, set the standard for their lives. Uh, and sometimes it gets discouraging, it gets hard because you don't think they get it. But then it always comes that email, comes that Facebook message or, or, or that phone call that lets you know, Coach, you planted a seed and this is what I'm doing in my life. And that's, that's much greater than wins and losses uh, when you really understand that. And for that, that makes me coach harder. That makes me want to make sure on the field we're representing not only this university, but the kings of kings and lords of lords. And, uh, you know, I'm just humbled to know that the Lord called me to do something like this. That's awesome. Last thing, people just know you as football coach. They see you out there on the field. They see you at practice. Away from the field, what do you, what do, you do? What are you into? What, what do you like to do outside of football? Do you even have a chance with the schedule that you keep? Yeah, you, know, uh, you know, outside of football, I just love spending time with my family. You know, I think as, as I get older, I realized the value of my family. You know, I got pictures. Now I'm looking at my son. He's seven. Uh, and, you, you know, sometimes you just wonder where the time goes. You know what I mean? And so for me, I think, you know, being around Coach Gill, he's helped me to realize, you know, you love football. You love the grind. I don't have no problem staying here at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. But at the end of the day, you only get one chance with your family. And my, my eight years with him, he's taught me, you know what, make sure your family uh, is uh, – you spend time with them. And, you know, I haven't been perfect all the time, but I think in the last couple of years, I've, I've tried to make sure when I'm at home, I'm home with my family. Coach, I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long time. I appreciate, appreciate it. You, man. Good God luck, man. We appreciate it. Thank you. Well, the Liberty men's hockey team opened up their season at home this past week, and we're taking on the Alabama Frozen Tide. That's right so-called the Crimson Froze. I don't know how that works exactly, but nonetheless, Flames would open up the scoring. Sam Carlson, the big Alaska boy, would get the Flames on the board first, but then Jesse Gordachuk of Alabama would stonewall the Flames. Liberty would outshoot the Tide 40 to 16 in game one, but they would end up dropping it by a score of three to one. Game two, the Flames offense would get going. Senior forward, big number 17, Grant Garvin would come alive with two goals and an assist, while Quinn Ryan would register a goal and an assist as well. This would propel the Flames to a 6-1 victory. And then Cole Burak would quietly have a solid night between the pipes, making 26 saves in the victory. The junior goaltender was just 90 seconds away from a shutout in his first game at Liberty until an unfortunate bounce would find the net. Well, for the first time since 2008, Liberty hosted a cross-country meet. The Flames hosted the Big South Preview this past Saturday on their brand new cross-country course. And they would find plenty of success on their home turf. On the men's side, Liberty's Azaria Kurwa won the 8K with seven Flames finishing among the first eight finishers as LU claimed the team win. As for the women, they would finish second to High Point, highlighted by freshman Noel Palmer's second place finish. Well, coming up, see the role that two special friendships have played in the life of one Liberty soccer player. And I leave it all on the set in this week's Warm, Hot, and Fuego. That's when Game On returns. Meet William Byron, Liberty University student and Xfinity Series driver of the number nine Chevrolet. 
Since William was a child, he dreamt of racing. His continued partnership with Liberty University means he's able to pursue his college degree while chasing the checkered flag. Look for William Byron and the Liberty University number no. 9 Chevrolet on race day during the Xfinity Series this season. I used to watch the medical shows on TV when I was younger and I wanted to be like the doctors and the nurses. But I think nursing was a really good fit for me because of the holistic approach that they take. There was a point in my nursing career that I was ready to go back. I actually remember two patients in particular telling me that they could see me doing more. The FNP DNP program is obtaining a family nurse practitioner degree. The DNP is the doctor of nursing practice. My husband and I love to go on mission trips and we've been on a few medical mission trips. And I believe that the FMP DNP degree will really open up the door on the mission field a lot more. I think there was a few things that stood out on this campus. Number one, how kind people were to each other and how much the faculty truly cared for us as students, wanting us to succeed in pursuing higher education. So I grew up in a Christian home. I was just kind of wishy-washy doing uh, the Christian kid sort of thing uh, up through 11th grade where I had a friend uh, basically convert out of Christianity. It rocked my world a little bit. I wasn't exactly sure that people could actually do that. So it kind of put me on a little bit of a quest for truth for myself. I went to a, a Christian concert and there was a tent sponsored by Liberty. And he was like, you could sign up for this scholarship drawing that we have. As I signed up for the scholarship, I myself sent a prayer up and a couple of songs later, they announced that I had won a $16,000 scholarship. I'd always kind of wanted to be an RA, and as I stepped into the role of prayer leader, it seemed logical to progress to another level, uh, to a spiritual life coach and then to resident assistant. Uh, my experience at Liberty has been uh, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't trade it for the world. Welcome back to Game On. Joining us now on the show is Bobby Bowling. And Bobby, you had a chance to hang out with the Lady Flame soccer team. Yes, yes, I did. Right. Jordan Castell and Bertha Martinez, two seniors for the Lady Flame soccer team that are not related by blood at all, but I would say are sisters in every sense of the word. Jordan Castell has played the game of soccer for as long as she could remember, enjoying every moment and never taking it too seriously. That mindset would change, however, when she joined a traveling soccer team and was introduced to the work ethic of Sarah Lott. Well, I found what hard work was from her was after and before every practice, she would stay and just do extra drills. And I was like, okay, well, that's what it takes to be a D1 athlete. I want to do that too, because she was very good. It was the goalkeeper's inspiration that would plant a seed in Jordan of someday competing at the highest level. But on July 23, 2008, Dorn's world would change as she heard the news that Sarah died in a tragic accident. When that happened, it kind of, it's like a hit of reality. It's like, what does that even mean? Like a good friend of yours passing away. And then you realize how much they were involved in your life when you played soccer. I decided I really wanted to keep my love for soccer up and I wanted to keep pursuing my dream because I know that she would want it. And, that's where I found the Majestic's gold, and when I found the gold, I, I found Bertha. Bertha Martinez was a midfielder for the Majestic's gold, a new teammate to Jordan who quickly turned into a good friend. But it wasn't on the field where the friendship would take off. It was on road trips with Jordan's family where Bertha would find herself a permanent seat. It started off with one tournament, and then two and three, and then over time they were like, 
just come with us. Basically, you've been coming with us all the time anyway, so I was like, okay. People would always just say, wow, the four of you guys are always together. And then we're like, yeah, we basically adopted her. So I became like their second daughter on away trips. We kind of got to know like who we truly are. And my parents got to know who Bertha was really fast. And they, like within a few weeks, we decided we're best friends and we've been best friends since. Now after spending eight years of traveling around the country together in the back seat, the next stop for the duo would be Liberty University where their friendship would deepen all the more got told we can move off, and Bertha and I probably the first people to run to an apartment because we finally wanted to live together. Yeah, we lived together in hotels for um, tournaments and stuff, but so we found our first apartment, and it was so cool. We made um, like all these crafts that say like our initials on it and like make sure everybody knew like this is our apartment. I had to take care of a lot of things in that room <laughs> to keep it clean, but just to start like having memories like that, living together and knowing that any time we're together, we have a fun time. Initially coming to Liberty wasn't all fun for Jordan. She struggled to fight her own personal demons while also trying to gain an understanding of Liberty's culture. When I came to Liberty, I was very overwhelmed. I was like, oh my gosh, everyone wants to share the gospel. Everybody wants to like be in your face about it. But in all truth, that it's not really how it is. People just want you to have eternal life with Christ. And I didn't really understand that at first. And I also thought you had to be fixed to be loved by God. And when a few of my teammates constantly were pouring into me and pouring into me that that's not what it is. Like you can go to God with whatever and he'll still love you. And they'd always talk Romans 5, 8. And that's what I have a tattoo of. And it talks about how God loved you in your darkest of times. And God loved me when I was being like the biggest sinner of all like sins. And I did things that I like, I felt guilty of after I came close to Christ. And I just know that God doesn't want you to come to him fixed. That's what your relationship with him is for. But as time passes by, Jordan has come to realize that God truly does place people in our lives to help shape us and mold us into the people we are meant to be. Nice job producing that story, Bobby. And it seems like you had a lot of fun getting to know those two. All right, well, we, we had a lot of fun the last couple weeks. Let me tell you, there was a never a dull moment with, with those yeah. two girls, as you can see in the video. But, you know, I think the biggest part of their story that stuck out to me, anyway, is that, you know, they strictly came to Liberty alone just for the soccer aspect. The Christian aspect came secondary. And, you know, if you ask them today what they're going to take away most from Liberty, I think the first thing both of them would say is that they found a relationship with God here together at Liberty University. And I just think that speaks volumes of what kind of place Liberty yeah. University is. For sure. Awesome mm -hmm. stuff. Well, time to send it over to Matt with some volleyball. Yeah, thank you, guys. Liberty Volleyball opened up Big South play on Tuesday night. They squared off with defending conference tournament champ High Point. Liberty's young squad jumped out to a lead, taking the first set at 25-23, but the Panthers would rally to take the next three and the match three sets to one. Casey Goodwin paced the Lady Flames with 14 kills, while Anna Gregg and Kana Williams each shipped in 11. Well, you know what time it is. That's right. It's time for Warm, <laughs> Hot, and Fuego. We're at McGiven here yep. to Name break it all down. Break yeah. it all down. Give us some insight. Yeah. Top three athletic performances of the week here at Liberty. We begin, as always, with Warm. Who's your choice? Warm, Anna Gregg. You were just talking I about did. volleyball. I actually just said her name. She's on that yeah. team. And you know what? Interesting thing here. Anna Gregg's a pretty tall lady, right? Yeah. The average female uses her height and lipstick every five years. I just found that on random Wait, stats. Wait, what? Of the average female yeah. uses her height and lipstick. All those little... Oh, height. oh in uses yeah. that much yeah. in lip. It, Got it. Every wow. five years. Every so five that's years. That's a lot of that lipstick. That is a lot of lipstick. Good but anyway, stats. This middle blocker, she had quite the game this past week she had 13 kills so your middle blocker is yeah. getting on the outside and even making some kills from the inside she's doing some good work and this has been a tough year for the Lady Flames volleyball team thus far but it's good to see that Anna last year she was yeah. second team all conference and she has taken a step in the right direction and being an impact player for volleyball this year and it's a young team that we expect yes. to continue to improve all right from warm now to hot we go to hot Aggie Maroney this young lady just absolutely doing work and as the season moves on she's getting hotter and hotter in terms of play. And Which that makes sense. Which is the choice for hot. Yes. yes. But yeah. also, down in Cordoba, Argentina, where she's from, yeah. summer starts in November. That's so it's true. Below the equator. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it makes sense. E equator, yeah. eh? Right? Equator. 
Anyways, equator. yeah. Equator? You, you really, never mind. Whatever. Anyways, but she's just did some absolutely, she was just owning the show yeah. for field hockey, yeah. and they went 2 0 this past week. She's a large part of that, uh, scoring three goals. You have a Canadian accent, you make it fun of the <laughs> yeah. way I talk. Yeah, that's true. Mm, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. think so. All right, yeah. finally, in Fuego, your pick for in Fuego this yeah, week. Yeah, AGG, this guy, just money in the bank. Yeah. I don't know how else you're going to put it, and he's just, you know, what? Go who's up must come down and he's just pulling it oh, down. Wow. Yeah, breaking up the tunes. No yeah, yeah, there shouldn't have been. Yeah. But yeah, what a what a performance by him just sneaking in behind the corners. A big guy, but so athletic. Yeah. And he can just burn people and so strong. Here he gets a you know a little screenplay and he's able to weave his way through some defenders as well. So he just keeps getting better and better. And we said it on the football broadcast this past week. He's a guy that I would be greatly surprised if he wasn't playing on Sundays in the future. Yeah, I agree with you on that. All right, well, still to come, it was dramatic, it was gut-wrenching, it was Liberty Football delivering another memorable win. We'll take one last look at it when we return. You might have heard some things about Liberty University, like how we're just a little Christian school in the middle of nowhere, and there's nothing to do here. I mean, come on, you know us. Boring. Boring? Yeah. They say we don't work as hard, think as hard, try as hard. I object. The truth is, well, we might surprise you. We the people. We are innovators, dreamers, leaders. Yeah, we feel pain. We get tired, but it won't stop us. God's call is our pursuit, and we will champion his name. The legends of tennis are coming to Lynchburg with the PowerShare Series. John McEnroe, Andy Roddick, Michael Chang, and James Blake compete in a unique one-night tournament. October 16th at Liberty University's Vine Center. Timeless tennis mastery on full display with a twist. On the PowerShare Series, these legends call their own lines. For tickets and VIP packages, go to PowerShareSeries.com and TicketReturn.com and be part of the excitement October 16th at Vine Center. about do it for this week's episode as always check us out on social media at game on lu yeah, and check out our website as well game on lu.com all our features are there for you to watch yeah that's right we leave you now with our call of the week courtesy of alan york and the flames big win over indiana state 23 yards out for indiana state snap is back low that's blocked the snap was low the kick was blocked and the game is over Liberty wins it 42-41. And Liberty is 3-0 to begin the year. 